The Clark Wallaby might be the most influential shoe that you didn't know was influential. At least I didn't before we started researching for this video. So we're gonna cut them in half to see what's on the inside and test the materials to see if they're really worth the money and see if it's worth investing in a pair of these now that they're back and they're popular again to see if they're really worth the hype. Today's video is brought to you by NordVPN and if you don't know what NordVPN is, it's an internet security and VPN service and they have 5,500 plus different servers in 59 different countries. So why does that matter? Well. NordVPN allows you to change the different country that you're in, in quotations, so you can have access to a ton of different movies, TV shows, entertainment, and even video games that aren't available to you based on where you live. And you can use that same location changing service to get discounts and on media and entertainment that are only available in certain countries. And if you're like me, you stream probably too much content, and more than you probably should, but the nice thing about NordVPN is it encrypts all your data so that the streaming services can no longer throttle your bandwidth down and make it impossible to stream your favorite junk TV. But aside from watching the content you want, how you want, NordVPN also is a very important tool for cyber threats and online dangers because NordVPN hides your actual location from everyone and encrypts all your data so people can't track you on the virtual world and in real life and protects all your information on the internet. And NordVPN will scan every file you download for malware and it also scans the URLs that you're headed to before you even get to them and block them from you so you don't even get to those sketchy websites that are trying to steal your information. So check out NordVPN via the link in my description or go to Nord nordvpn.com slash rosanville and use the code rosanville to get your exclusive nordvpn deal and it's risk-free and has a 30-day money-back guarantee so you can try it for 30 days and if you hate it you get your money back but i have a feeling you're gonna like the added protection on the internet so thanks again to nordvpn so this shoe has a lot longer history than i ever would have imagined and it all started in 1821 when cyrus clark started processing hides with fell mongering tanning and wool stapling which two of those words i didn't know what they meant up until this point and then in 1828, they started inverting sheepskin rugs and selling them as slippers. So they take the, the fuzzy part, flip it to the inside and make little slippers out of them. And then in 1833, Cyrus and James started C and J Clark Trading, an official company to start selling their goods, but they almost went bankrupt in the 1860s. So kind of a rough start for the Clarks. And then 40 years later, post-World War II in the 1950s, Nathan Clark developed a desert boot after his tour in World War II. And that's really what Clarks is the most known for is their desert boots. And then also in the 50s, Nathan Clark developed the crepe sole that Clarks is known for today and virtually invented the casual shoe market. And then 10 years after the sole development, Clarks came out with the Wallaby in 1967. And it was an adapted model from the German made moccasins called grasshoppers and they had some pretty killer marketing around these shoes that kind of leaned into how ugly they were and then in the 60s and 70s the wallabies became synonymous with the rude boy culture and then next it hit europe's acid house movement in the late 80s and early 90s because you couldn't wear sneakers at the club at the time so these were a nice non-dress shoe that were comfortable that they could wear and then by the mid 90s this was a brit pop staple shoe and the verve album cover has a pair of these then throughout the rest of the 90s these became super influential through the 90s rap scene worn by some pretty big names like Notorious B.I.G., Slick Rick, Wu-Tang Clan, MF Doom, and a lot of other people. And then as the 2000s came around, they kind of dropped off in the popular culture and weren't that popular, but they haven't really ever stopped selling them and they've kind of had a few blips on their radar, but now they're back again. And now these are getting really popular. There's a lot of hype around them. A lot of the streetwear guys are wearing these. They've do, they're doing some interesting collabs with Supreme and Drake and Carhartt, Kith. So it seems like they're on the upswing again. And that's the cool thing about doing the quick histories of the shoes. And now I have a whole new found appreciation for this shoe and the history and the, and the cultural significance of the shoe that I had no idea before doing this. So now let's get to the actual quality of the shoe, starting with the leather first. So this is a pretty decent leather. It's tanned by CF Stead in England, and they are world famous for doing basically the highest end suede leather you can get. And it's a chrome tan leather that's surprisingly thick. It's 2.2 millimeters thick. And that's way thicker than most sneakers and that's up in that boot thickness range. So it's gonna be a nice durable leather. And I like that they finished the flesh on the inside. It's a nice smooth texture on the inside. But where does this lie on the leather cross section from the grain down to the really loose fibers? It's really hard to tell with this because you can't really see that grain. But I think I see just a little sliver of that top portion that's called the grain that's synonymous with the smooth portion smooth portion of leather right at the very bottom of the cross section so i think what they do is they take a hide they sand down the top grain to get it really even and, and give it a little bit of that furry nap and then they put a layer of wax over top to lay it nice and flat then they flip that fuzzy bottom side that's the suede to the outside and that's where you see this really nice even 
uh, textured suede on the outside. So technically this would be a rough out waxed nubuck. And I'm working on a grading system for the suede and like the fuzzy leathers. So maybe the next time we do a suede leather, I'll have that finalized. But overall, it's a pretty good leather, especially if it has just a little bit of a sliver of the grain in there. And it's thick enough that even if it doesn't, it's a, it's a lot better of a suede than what you see on most sneakers and other shoes that have little panels of suede. Next to the outsole, this is another thing that Clarks is really well known for, their natural crepe rubber outsoles. And this is about as natural of a rubber outsole as you can get. It's a lot less processed and that you can see it's just kind of chunky and it's really, really soft and squishy and people love this type of outsole because it's so comfortable. There are some negative, negative aspects to it. People have big chunks fall off of it. And once you wear this flat, they're really, really slippery. And, and obviously they look really dirty, really fast, which annoys some people. But overall, a crepe rubber outsole is a really good casual outsole. And maybe the biggest potential negative of this outsole isn't even the compound or how it's built. It's more that it's just really small. You know, you, if you look down the, the side of this, the outsole tucks underneath of the upper. So if you have really wide feet, your, your pinky toe might push this upper out and you might be standing on the edge of the outsole, which I would assume would be really uncomfortable. And then if we move to the inside of the shoe, there's not a whole lot on the inside. All there is is a sock liner that feels like it has foam underneath and you do have a dedicated counter cover on the inside, which is the biggest fail point with any shoe. Everyone's seen it where you just wear out the inside of your, your shoe at the heel because your heel slips and wears that fabric out. And so they've reinforced it with a nice thick suede leather on the inside. So there's a good chance you're never gonna wear through that. So that brings us to the construction because this construction is fairly unique, especially compared to all the different mock toe boots and the other shoes we've cut apart that have mock toes because this is a true moccasin construction where this side piece wraps all the way underneath seamlessly and comes back up this other side and then is sewn to this toe piece right here. And people really like this style of construction because it's more durable because you don't have the stitching of a strobel stitch and you don't have the upper that's tucked underneath that's just glued in or sometimes sewn in. It's just one seamless piece. So there's no stitching for it to fail anywhere. And because there's no seams, there's no high spots or seams that you're gonna be standing on all day. And they also can be really easy to resole because all you do is pull the outsole off and glue a new one on. There's no stitching to undo at all. And all the stitching in the shoe that holds it all together is right here at the toe. This is essentially the only stitching that matters for this entire shoe. And it's made of two pieces, which is kind of crazy. And I really like the way that they finished the mock toe itself because we've seen basically two different types of mock toe stitchings. A fake mock toe where the leather is puckered up and then a, a, a seam is sewn around it to make it look like a mock toe. And then we've seen where it's a two piece mock toe where they come to a point and the undersides come together and are sewn together, together, giving you that ridge of the mock toe. But the wallabies take it one step further where this upper piece on the vamp not only sews to the under piece, but it's wrapped around the top, hiding that seam where those two pieces come together and also allow you to have three layers of leather that you're stitching through. So it gives it a cleaner look, it gives it a little bit more durability and maybe a little bit more waterproof. But the thing that really stands out to me is I, I'm about 95% sure this is hand sewn on here because it is a little bit jagged, it's a little bit rough. The stitches are really wide, it uses a really thick stitching thread, but more importantly, you can see where it's been tied off and if you pop one of these stitches, it's not linked together like a sewing machine thread does where the upper thread and the bottom thread loop around each other. This is sewn a lot more like a saddle is sewn in the same way that we sew our wallets, shameless plug, where you have two needles on a single thread and you're weaving the thread in and out. So that if you do pop a stitch, the whole thing doesn't come unraveled like you do when you pop a stitch on your, your sleeve. It's just a way more durable technique for sewing leather together. And that's why we use it in the wallets. And that's why I was really surprised that they did this on this, this shoe because that's a really labor intensive handmade touch to this shoe. So this shoe is already significantly more impressive and has a lot cooler history than I expected before we even start doing this video. But we haven't seen what's on the inside yet. There could be some catastrophic flaws or some issues or maybe some things that aren't what they look like. So now let's cut them in half to see if we can figure out the truth of these Clark Wallabies. All right, we got them cut in half and these are really easy to cut, 
but they completely clog up the bandsaw. The band gets caked in melted rubber and then that melted rubber gets stuck on the wheels and you end up having to clean the bandsaw every time we cut one of these crepe rubber outsoles. But whatever, let's see what's inside. So just like we guessed, there is that foam wedge on the inside there. And I think the majority of the reason they put that in there is for two reasons. To cut costs just a little bit and to make these shoes not quite as heavy as they would be if you had another like heavy layer of rubber on the inside there. And you can also see that there's a reinforced cardboard, almost like shank on the inside. And I think what that's there for is to add a little bit of stability to the shoe, to get this rubber and foam to press to compress equally and to almost act as it was a little bit of a shank because of how soft and floppy these are. And my only fear with this is that it would slowly separate over time and then see how like as this flexes they rub against each other. That could prematurely wear these out or this could break. Ideally you would just have leather all the way underneath like a true moccasin, but it makes sense that it's in there. And the, the counter is the cellulose. And then other than that, there's not a whole lot else in the shoe. The only thing that I was wrong about was that the upper doesn't tuck underneath the entire through the entirety of the shoe it stops right where that sock liner starts and then it's just tucked underneath and glued at the heel so are the clark wallabies worth the money at 160 dollars i think that they are you know there's some improvements that could be made but they have really good materials a pretty solid construction and they have a few handmade touches that i wouldn't have expected to have on a 160 dollars shoe so i think they're worth it would I get a pair? Now that I know the history of the shoe and how deep it actually is and how many different people wore these shoes and how many different sub genres of different artists art, artists, and different groups of people have adopted them and made them their own and made them popular in their own way. And the fact that they're a half moccasin construction and they have pretty decent materials and they're really comfortable. I think I'm gonna get a pair. And I, I just like the look of them. I like the way that people are wearing them nowadays with like a little bit like the dad jean look. I'm gonna get a pair. So I, I, have a, I have a newfound appreciation for this shoe that I just kind of dismissed before doing this video. Because this, this video was super interesting. I had no idea how deep the history of the shoe actually is and how impactful it's been on culture and how many different cultures it's been a part of. It's really cool. And so thanks for watching and let me know what your experiences are in this shoe. Did I miss anything? And thank you so much for your support. It's what allows us to do these really deep dives into these shoes and what allows us to cut apart two different shoes basically every single week so that you guys know what you're spending your hard-earned money on. It's really fun and uh, thank you guys so much for everything. See ya.